Hey y'all. Today, I wanna to talk about the origins of the police in the United States. This topic was inspired by a conversation had on the Grapevine's YouTube channel. They were talking about the disparity between police interaction and harassment in black and white communities. I do wanna mention, because of something Officer Edwin Raymond, a member of the panel said, I acknowledge that most police officers are unaware of the racist origins of their chosen career. A lot of men and women are truly out there trying to save lives and don't wanna cause any harm. They don't mean to contribute to the stereotypes. God bless the souls lost in the line of duty and comfort their families, I pray. To those who have been and even currently with this pandemic are trying to be compassionate in service to their communities, thank you. While the United States was in her infancy, policing looked very different from the police force we see today. During colonial times, night watches existed, kind of like what we know as the neighborhood watch today. They started off with volunteers grouping together to protect their communities against fire, crime, and disorder. Then, private citizens began to pay untrained, not very well-respected men to patrol their streets and maintain order. Boston became the first U.S. city to actually establish an official night watch in 1631. Cities like New York and Philadelphia also had night watches, but to the south, there were more commonly slave patrols. Starting in the Carolina colonies of the south, slave patrols existed to keep tabs on enslaved black people. They monitored black people's limited movement and they were legally allowed to stop blacks and demand to see slave badges of enslaved blacks that were let off their plantations. These white men could also legally search their belongings, never asking for consent, of course, since blacks weren't even considered human, let alone American citizens. They weren't allowed to read or write and neither were any free blacks that found themselves in the South. There were also slave catchers who worked with the slave patrols to chase, find, and return the runaways. Slave catchers were extremely brutal and merciless, even using dogs as weapons, not only to track runaways, but to torture them as well. These men and women existed for hundreds of years, terrorizing black men and women, human beings, and enforcing the idea that whites were natural authority figures over blacks. They existed to protect the very institution of slavery, which by 1860 represented 4 million enslaved blacks and at least $3.5 billion. 10 years prior, in 1850, the second Fugitive Slave Act was passed saying that all citizens, law enforcement and non-law enforcement alike, had a duty to return or at least aid in the return of runaway slaves. Slave catchers used such legislations to even kidnap free blacks from the North and sell them back into slavery. Meanwhile, in the North, law enforcement was becoming more standardized. New York led the urban cities by becoming the first to establish a publicly funded, organized police force. They did this in 1845, according to their website. Philadelphia and Boston followed suit in 1854. Unfortunately, Northern law enforcement worked with slave catchers to oppress blacks, opting to help send these human beings fleeing terror back to the South. Vigilante groups also became mainstream in the 18th and 19th centuries. The Ku Klux Klan was a particularly violent vigilante group that was originally founded by six former Confederate officers in 1865. They, along with the groups whites formed all over the South of the same name, aimed to promote white supremacy. They terrorized blacks, assassinating and threatening blacks, especially those who were politically active. A lot of members of law enforcement alongside prominent Southern Democrats were members of the KKK. It's no wonder that during the same period, black codes were enacted all over the South. Just as in the days of slavery, black codes existed to control the movement of black people, the Southern labor force. Mississippi and South Carolina enacted the first of these laws in 1865, the same year the Klan was established. They required black residents to have written proof of employment and specifically taxed any blacks who had the audacity to hold any occupation other than farmer or servant. If blacks attempted to break employment contracts, they'd be subject to fines or even arrested. In some states, States, black codes were literally slave codes in which the word slave was replaced by Negro. In 1870, President Ulysses S. Grant, former leader of the Union Army and Congress, established the Department of Justice. The department's main function at the time was to address the growing list of legal cases after the Civil War and to protect civil rights that were being threatened, both by violent vigilante groups like the Ku Klux Klan, as well as racist litigation like Black Codes, which opposed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Under President Grant, there were thousands of indictments against members of the KKK. 
Unfortunately, most members were acquitted of their terrorist crimes, and the majority of those convicted served light prison sentences. On the other hand, the exception found on the 13th Amendment that said prisoners would still be subject to slavery made blacks targets for law enforcement. Arrests were oftentimes not based on crimes, but on labor needs. To replace some of the labor force lost after the 13th Amendment was passed, many men and women, overwhelmingly African American, were put to hard labor because of petty crimes, such as stealing a farm animal worth $10, punishable by as much as five years in jail. Prisoners were put to involuntary servitude through a practice known as convict leasing, in which the state would lease out prisoners and therefore profit from the plantations and industrial that were paying for their labor. These prisoners suffered under unfair and unlivable conditions. Leased convicts died at a much higher rate than non-leased convicts, and while they lived, they suffered illness, malnutrition, cruel punishments, and torture. Convict leasing continued to be common practice well into the 1900s. Unofficially, of course, convict leasing existed for many years after that. Today, states still use prisoners for states' use and nonprofit entities. Around the turn of the century, it was becoming more and more clear that the country needed organized police on the state and federal levels. Local police were becoming increasingly corrupt because they were still being controlled by local communities. The Federal Bureau of Investigation was established in 1908 specifically for the purpose of investigating anarchists, stopping check fraud and sex trafficking, which they called white slavery, and to limit the growing scope and influence of the Ku Klux Klan. Unfortunately, from 1924 to 1972, J. Edgar Hoover served as director of the FBI. Hoover has an extremely problematic tenure in his almost 50 years of service to the country. At the time, the things he did were accepted by law enforcement and government officials alike. But today, we are flabbergasted by the practices such as his homophobic employment policies, his shady information collecting techniques, and his specific racial targeting of civil rights figures and organizations during the civil rights movement. Under the guise of a domestic counterintelligence program, the FBI created COINTELPRO to infiltrate and destroy civil rights organizations. COINTELPRO targeted the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., for example, beginning to monitor him in December of 1955 until his death in 1968. Although they never discovered any Communist Party ties as Hoover claimed was the intent of his investigation, the FBI described Martin Luther King as the most dangerous and effective Negro leader in the country. One of the reasons they described him as such was that he called out police brutality. Besides the fact that the Nadir and the Jim Crow era had proven police were unwilling to protect black Americans, recent clashes with police had been exposed in newspaper publications. The excessive use of force on those who dared to exercise their First Amendment rights to protest, that force was on the news for everyone to see. The police were beating blacks off of the white sections of the bus and arresting them for simply sitting on lunch counters. They were legally hosing young men and women down in the street and setting police canines on them, true descendants of the slave catchers. Even citizens who weren't protesting were subject to police brutality. Tensions between police and black citizens erupted in the Watts riots of 1965 among many across the country that year and in subsequent years. Detroit in 1967. South Jamaica, Queens in 1974, Miami in 1982 and 1989, Los Angeles in 1992, Cincinnati and Ferguson in 2014. There is a long history of this tension and this general distrust between the Black community and the police of the United States. The police has always been a completely different entity to Black people than it has been to whites. The police are dangerous to Blacks while simultaneously they are safety and security to whites. And from the opposite perspective, police are more suspicious of Blacks than they are of whites. And this isn't a personal judgment. This is according to a study based on 20 million traffic stops in North Carolina from 2002 to 2016. Black drivers are twice as likely to be pulled over. They are also four times more likely to be searched. This study was conducted by political scientists Frank Baumgartner, Derek F., and Kelsey Shu. When they first published their findings, the Association of Chiefs of Police in North Carolina commissioned a 100-plus page report to dismiss their findings as deeply flawed. 
But in 2018, these authors said that they did have some dialogue with police and that the police agreed that focusing on those who were actually committing crimes, those who were speeding or running stop signs or drunk driving, focusing on them is much more productive and will save a lot more lives than just randomly stopping and searching people of color. I pray that more police forces in this country and around the world would take a look at their practices. How do they exist? How do they present themselves to the black community in contrast to the way that they present themselves to the white community? I pray for individual police officers to check the plank in their own eye. It's said that James Comey kept transcripts of the wiretaps that the FBI did on Martin Luther King, and he kept them on his desk while he was director of the FBI to remind himself not to get carried away with power, not to feel like he had license to do anything that he wanted to do just because he he was in law enforcement, let alone the highest seat in law enforcement. May more people have that humble approach in wanting to actually serve justice rather than just wanting to have a title, rather than just wanting to be an authoritarian over black people and over people of color, people that you How don't can you justify killing an innocent man. How do you walk into someone's home and shoot them while they're minding their own business? How do you shoot them to death in the dead of night in their own home? Check your heart between you and God, because there is a God who judges us all. And he doesn't judge based on the outer man. He judges based on what's in our hearts. He judges based on what's in our hearts. Thank you guys so much for watching. By the way, you guys, I really didn't know how to work this into the timeline, but here are a couple of interesting facts about police methods of transportation. Police were on foot patrol for over 200 years until 1871 when the first mounted unit was formed. These officers rode horseback and the horse-drawn patrol wagon made its debut in 1881. Some officers started riding bicycles in 1895 and motorcycles started being used in 1904. Officers didn't commonly patrol in cars until after World War II when the automobile industry saw a boom and there was a need for a stronger police presence in streets and highways. Thank you again to the police officers who serve all of the people regardless of what they look like. Thanks y'all for watching.